Okay, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are. Uh, thanks everybody for joining. My name is Vas Vasiliadis at the University of Chicago. And today's session is going to be an overview of two things that we think are really important uh, for those of you that have been awarded um, uh, funding through the CC STAR program uh, that the NSF has been running for the last few years. Uh, and those two things are the Science DMZ and then some tooling to actually take advantage of that in the form of Globus. So uh, I have with me today um, Ken Miller from ESNet. Uh, some of you may be familiar with, uh, with, with Ken and certainly with ESNet, I hope. Uh, so Ken is going to kick it off and do a, a quick walkthrough of the Science DMZ uh, and some of the things that some of the programs that are underway right now uh, for folks to sort of performance tune their networks. And then uh, I'm going to do a very high level overview of Globus and, uh, and then we can take some questions. Uh, so stepping into this uh, setup here, the Science DMZ has been around for a number of years, um, really set up to we create a clean path, a high bandwidth path for data transfer for uh, large science applications. Uh, many enterprise and uh, campus networks access layer switches cannot handle the, uh, the amount of volume uh, some of these larger science transfers happening. So the Science DMZ was established and then it's a design pattern going forward. Um, sometimes on some CC star proposals and pieces like this, people think they need to mimic this and you know match this uh, diagram directly. Um, but it's really a design pattern and a template to be used um, based on what your network is doing, what your science is on your campus, and um, really what kind of use cases you have you uh, submitted in your science DMZ uh, and CC STAR proposal. So here's another version of this, uh, really set up for um, an HPC facility. So if you have something on campus where you have a uh, HPC cluster or a supercomputer, uh, possibly how it's tied out to a backend parallel file system, and you might have some data transfer nodes across um, down here distributing the data according to this piece. So this is just one piece, um, a design related to this that you could um, take a look at uh, if this is really in your proposal. Um, a second would be if you have more of a distributed science DMZ where you have um, instruments and uh, projects related uh, around different areas of your campus, uh, the science DMZ design pattern can be extended via, in this case, dark fiber out to certain project areas on your campus so that you can actually extend this um, directly to back to the Science DMZ switch for the data transfer or a data portal, say from like a cryo EM or a system like that, that produces a large amount of data that would really be um, inefficient to be able to transfer across, you know, a standard, you know, campus network. Uh, this extends the Science DMZ out to those remote locations. Um, because you can't obviously put a cryo EM inside a data center or uh, another system where these networks are. are. Uh, but on a campus, typically their access via fiber is pretty prevalent. So you can actually extend this out to those locations. So those are just three quick examples um, of what you're possibly could be doing in your science DMZ um, and for your CC STAR proposal. So next steps, um, what we can build on this, uh, there's many other uh, components to this as we scale this out. And we have the wide area networks to deal with. Um, science DMZ is connected to those networks can be extended. And also the data transfer nodes we talked about. So, so many of these data transfer problems are end-to-end -end problems. So you might see, you know, three to five different networks you might cross uh, when you're doing a data transfer. But what does the scientist actually see? They might just see their application. They might see a CLI. They might see some kind of data transfer or data portal uh, that they have access to or they're trying to pull data from. So in that case, you know, a lot of these, uh, the infrastructure components behind the CC star are really hidden from um, many of the researchers. So we need to make sure that we can scale these things out appropriately to be able to handle these large transfers that uh, scientists can just use um, so that we're not um, dealing with these uh, or shipping hard drives around the country. So uh, traditionally, uh, data portals have been really set up on an enterprise network. Uh, there might be, you know, a file system with a web server on the front of it uh, that could be just sitting somewhere in a data center and probably now on a VM or even a Docker container um, taken like that. So we've already talked about the network infrastructure for the CC star with the science DMZ but we have these legacy portals that are out there just sharing data. So if we could combine the two, you could actually separate out the existing web portal, the database, the authentication, all the pieces behind the enterprise firewall. But then when a data transfer happens, um, you can actually initiate a 
an API call out to the data transfer nodes so that you're only exposing the data transfer nodes uh, just for data transfers and that's it. It's not a web server sitting on the outside of the firewall that you know has the entire internet looking at it. Um, we can actually put uh, more direct security controls on this and only uh, have the API and the data transfers exposed uh, to, across the fast data path. So that's an idea of taking something that was established as a, more of a um, CAN solution and breaking the two components out so that you can actually you know, have something that is tight and secured and has a stateful firewall in front of it for the portal server, but then actually uh, use the science DMZ model and the fast data path to be able to do transfers this way. So as we get into this, looking at the design pattern, um, you know, what a lot of times when you get to science DMZ and the CC star, they will go through um, your get your network, you'll design it, you'll lay it out, and you start doing your persona testing and you build a mad dash, and you might get your network cleaned up and you might see your how your routing has changed or you find an MTU mismatch. I mean, many of these things go into the CC star um, review once you're setting this up and you design. Um, but how it's interesting how many people are not actually measuring the data transfer speeds. So as we look at the previous design patterns and um, looking at the different models of modern portals, data portals, um, what kind of speed should you be expecting? So if you're looking at one terabyte set up here, you know, if you transfer that at 2.2 gigabits a second, so that's the average of one terabyte over one hour. So if we start with that as a baseline for many of these transfers, we can step into um really kind of establishing how well these are doing and both the the one terabyte transfer over 20 minutes to one hour should be able to be done with a single 10 gig dtn so so we established a project related to this um route called the data mobility exhibition and what this involves is really um, baselining and doing transfers from known tuned endpoints that operate very well so that you can actually test your campus ci um, your CC star and your data data architecture on your campus. So a single DTN, a pool of DTNs, multiple D DTNs with different backends. Really, um, it's really relevant to your ca campus network. So as you step into these pieces, um, a lot of the pieces from the data mobility exhibition um, were built from the petascale DTN project, which was uh, completed a few years ago and trying to be able to transfer a petabyte within one week. So the data mobility exhibition was established um, for anyone in the CC star program or any RE or DOE sites to participate. Uh, the basic context is you upload and download data sets. You try to measure yourself against a baseline of one terabyte per hour to see kind of what, um, what speeds you're getting and to be able to look at your architecture, your, your network, your MTUs, your storage architecture, many of these pieces can play. This is a multi-component problem uh, to try to work through these things. So potentially what you're really doing is trying to build an end-to-end -end test where you know the other end of the network is tuned well and performing well. So it really comes back on, do you have the problem or not? So we started this in 2019, uh, went through last year. We've extended it through the PI meeting uh, up through this September uh, where we're at now. So uh, again, the basic steps are you kind of complete a quick diagram of your network, a one to two page description of that. You start doing your transfers um, with Globus working. You download, upload the data sets, you share your results. And if you would like any assistance with these steps, um, you can get a hold of um, the EPIC, the Engagement Performance Operations Center at epic.iu.edu uh, to try to streamline some of these results. Uh, the current DTN nodes um, are in Ithaca, New York, at Cornell. There's also one in Boulder and one in Argonne. There are also uh, two cloud connectors through Google Drive and Box. And there's also um, ESNet's going to be standing up uh, two DTNs uh, to be able to support this in the future as well. The current results from this, again, we're drawing two baselines on the tests. Um, we see uh, two of the two end sites obviously are skewing the graph there a little bit. So you can see how well a tuned end site is doing. Um, the red line on the graph is the one terabyte per hour baseline. And the uh, yellow line is the petascale baseline, which is roughly six terabytes per hour. So you can see um, roughly over the last year, we've had over 10,000 tests uh, available. So you kind of see what the kind of where, where the results lie on this chart. This is from unique sources. 
And this graphic is from unique destinations. So kind of the other way, while they uploading or downloading files. So you can see that, you know, some sites are, you know, above the one terabyte per hour baseline, but um, only the really tuned in sites from the peta scale and a few other locations uh, are up at the pedal scale line of this. So, you know, we have some work to do for some of these larger servers um, or 10 gig clusters, but the, the 10 gig nodes should be focused on the one terabyte per hour baseline to start. Uh, this quick chart includes uh, kind of the different numbers you're looking at broken down into where you are on the, the one terabyte per hour range. Um, if you're more of a network admin, you might be used to the same context here in the gigabits per second, and you might have another one here based on the storage transfer. So uh, you can kind of use these charts to gauge where you're at, but we want to see people around this one terabyte per hour now. And then from there, uh, we just kind of included the quad chart we do for the, the CC Star PI meeting. If you want to read these details, it's a lot of the same text, but this is the quad chart we've used for the CC Star PI meeting. And if you're interested in the program, the links are included. So thank you. Great. Thank you, Kim. Switch over and uh, share my screen. Okay, so um, as Ken pointed out, uh, the foundation for um, doing things right on your network is setting up uh, the science DMZ uh, and and configuring your data transfer nodes uh, appropriately. So once you have that in place, uh, we think something like Globus is uh, really uh, an indispensable tool for you to take advantage of that uh, well-tuned infrastructure. Uh, and I'm gonna talk about two aspects here. One is the Globus service itself and the other is Globus Connect, which is uh, the software that you uh, install on your, um, uh, on your data transfer node to connect to, to the Globus service. Um, I'm gonna to touch briefly on who and what Globus is just because I see uh, quite a few new uh, names um, on the list of attendees. Um, and then I'm going to spend time looking at Globus very briefly from three perspectives, that of the, the researcher, the scientist, uh, from the perspective of someone who's delivering the service or providing the infrastructure to support the science or the research being done. And then also from the perspective of, of the developer, uh, as Ken mentioned, for people building data portals and so on. So very quickly then, Globus is a service that's uh, built and operated by the University of Chicago. Most of us on the team came out of uh, industry. We're professional software people, and we've been uh, running um, this enterprise um, to help uh, uh, scientists do their work um, more efficiently, basically, across the board, um, and basically take data management off the table as, as an issue or as a barrier to, to doing uh, more and better science. Uh, Globus is uh, fairly widely deployed and used. Um, I also do see some familiar names on this list. So thank you uh, to those folks for joining and supporting us. Uh, we get a lot of our funding from uh, federal agencies, but we also have um, uh, a sustainability model that relies on subscriptions. Um, and, and we do have a number of institutions that are kind enough to support us um, with funding on a, on a recurring basis. So, Looking at Globus from the researcher perspective, um, at, at its core, really, it's about easy, fast, and secure uh, data movement um, and being able to move data between any types of systems, be they your laptop, uh, cloud storage, uh, some HPC system, uh, archival, what have you. Uh, there's a, a nice, at least I think it's nice, uh, uh, user interface, a graphical user interface. So you just point your browser to globus.org. Uh, log in with uh, credentials from your institutions. Typically, you don't even have to create um, a Globus account. Uh, and then you can point and click, select uh, the two systems between which you want to move data, uh, and off you go. Uh, Globus takes care of moving the data. Uh, here's uh, just one single snapshot of uh, a transfer that I did a few months ago. Um, this is between uh, two well-tuned endpoints, as Ken was describing. So um, one of these is the Research Data Archive at NCAR. So this is between a system in Boulder and a system uh, down the road here um, in Chicago at, at Argonne National Lab. Uh, so you can see on a, on a fast network, but in particular with uh, well-tuned data transfer nodes, a nice clean path, um, you can actually uh, really take advantage of, of, uh, of some of that bandwidth and some of those capabilities. Uh, the third aspect, to, to everything that we do at Globus is security. It's actually the, the foundational aspect in many respects. Um, uh, the one key point, as I mentioned, is um, trying to ensure that most people can access it using their existing um, institutional uh, credentials. 
Uh, we don't want to manage passwords, usernames, and so on. Um, all the data um, flow directly between the two systems. Globus never sees any of that. We simply do things like integrity checks to make sure that uh, you know byte A was moved as byte A to the other side. Um, we have various things in place to ensure high availability. Um, and we also uh, allow encryption of data, uh, which is required in certain cases, like when you're handling uh, protected data, for example. Uh, the other aspect that's really critical to research is being able to share the data. Um, again, we make this possible um, via Globus without having to deal with local accounts and so on. Uh, and in particular, uh, more and more we're seeing the need to share data uh, in environments where certain uh, restrictions apply, whether you have to comply with certain re regulations uh, or you have sensitive or protected data of some form. So we have a number of mechanisms um, that allow you to do that uh, so that sharing doesn't necessarily become uh, the scary thing that you're opening up your data to the world. Uh, Ken mentioned instruments. Uh, this is a growing use case for us. Um, an example um, that, that I use quite often is um, here at, at Argon um, with the advanced photon source. There's a whole bunch of beamlines that are generating literally terabytes of data every day. Uh, being able to grab that data, move it very quickly, do some uh, pre-processing, um, do some uh, further analyses and image rendering and so on, and then push data out um, to some kind of data store where people can come along and find it and sort of magically have science happen. Uh, that's really the kind of, uh, of, of capability that, that we're um, enabling with Globus services. In particular, this one uses a service called Globus Flows. Uh, I'm not gonna go into any of these specifics here, but um, you know, if you have interest in any of these, I'd be more than happy to talk about them in the Q&A or uh, you can reach me afterwards as well. Uh, just quickly from the perspective of a resource provider or system administrator, uh, I mentioned this thing called endpoints. So what you have, um, on your system, both on the source and the destination systems is this piece of software called Globus Connect. And then we, Globus, host uh, a single uh, multi-tenant service on, on AWS actually that, that uh, controls um, the, the transfers, controls uh, security and, and so on. Uh, so if you sort of overlay that on the, on the Science DMZ uh, architecture that Ken was showing, this is kind of how it looks conceptually. So you have this nice clean data path and sort of the, the fat green line. Uh, and then this thin dotted line, which is just the control channel as we call it, uh, that's keeping track of what's going on um, on either side. So as I said, you install this Globus Connect software, you can install that on, on a personal system, on, on a laptop, uh, you know, desktop, uh, lab server, what have you. Um, but more often than not, you're installing this on one of these data transfer nodes that Ken was describing. Uh, so you install that and it makes uh, the Globus service accessible. Uh, it makes that system accessible via the Globus service uh, for all the users on that storage system. Uh, and you can, there's a number of controls that you have uh, about restricting access, um, you know, allowing only certain parts of the file system to be available and so on. Um, there's tons of that all in our documentation if you'd like to look at. As I mentioned, we support a lot of different types of systems. This is a current list of the systems for which we have uh, connectors, as we call them. Uh, so once you have your system connected, users are doing certain things. You want to have uh, some level of uh, administrative control and visibility. So we have um, a real-time view that you can see uh, gives you a, um, a sense of who's doing what uh, on, on the system, what's being moved from where to where. You can drill down into this and do troubleshooting for your users if need be. Uh, we also provide historical um, usage reporting so you can get a snapshot of what was done over a certain time frame or get full uh, detailed logs um, of all transfers over time. Uh, so that's uh, the, the administrator uh, sort of system provider perspective. Uh, and I'll briefly touch on um, the developer perspective because as Ken said, a lot of folks are uh, standing up data portals, science gateways and other um, applications for making data available uh, to a broader community. Uh, so we provide a number of services uh, that allow you to do this uh, beyond the, the web interface that I showed you just a, a second ago. Uh, there's a command line interface, which is interesting if you want to script things. But typically, if you want to build something at greater scale, you really need to uh, build something that talks directly to the Globus APIs. So we have um, a number of services that, are, that have um, defined APIs 
The transfer and sharing is obviously the core of it, as, as, long, as well as um, a service we call Auth, which handles all the identity and access management. But then there's these um, sort of higher value services, if you will, like, like uh, Globus Search and Globus Flows that allow you to do more interesting um, uh, things with your data. Uh, and there's lots of examples of these out there. Um, a, a number of communities have stood up repositories um, using Globus services. Uh, and if that's something that's of interest, we have uh, a whole bunch of tools, uh, sample code um, on our GitHub repos, um, as well as uh, Python uh, Jupyter notebooks that you can run through and get a sense for, uh, you know, experiment with the API and see how the various pieces fit together. So that's just, again, a very quick flyover. Um, I've got some links here uh, to, to various support resources. Uh, both globus.org and docs.globus.org are a good starting point for you to dig into what we have available uh, in more detail. And with that, um, we'll switch over to uh, an open discussion. Uh, I don't know if there's any questions in the chat or in the q and I see one actually in the Q&A. Um, if you'd like to, um, uh, to, to ask a question live, please just uh, lower, I mean, uh, raise your, your virtual hand. Um, I click on the click on your icon and raise your hand and we'll unmute you so you can ask it live. Um, I see one question uh, here from, from Jacob. How do you handle the ephemeral port given that you're not using the conventional firewall? We are trying to set up Globus on our data transfer node within the science DMZ, but in the course of testing, we are having to allow traffic on the standard Globus ports. 50,000, 51,000, and 443. Since routers can't track sessions, we are also having to open all ports above 1023 to allow for the return traffic. This is a big risk, even as the host firewall has been turned on. Any suggestions on how to do this? Uh, Ken, I don't know if you want to, you feel free to jump in here. Um, so Jacob, I, uh, I, I'm, it's not quite clear why you would have to do that. Um, this, uh, th those standard port ranges, the 50 to 51,000, as you said, the ephemeral ports, um, as long as the firewall, I mean, well, if you have a science DMZ, this shouldn't be behind the firewall, right? So, so I guess this is where I'm sort of a little confused by the question, um, but um, you should be um, allowing, um, you sh your, your rules um, on your uh, on your router should allow traffic to come through on fifty to fifty one thousand. Basically, what's happening is during the um, uh, the initiation of the transfer, um, uh, a connection is opened on um, a port or one or more ports in that in that range, and then it's closed down. These ports aren't listening, but they do have to allow traffic in both directions. I'm I'm not sure why you would have to open ports above ten twenty three. Maybe there's a um, uh, a router config. Uh, um, uh, change that has to be made there. I don't know, Ken, if you have any thoughts on that, feel free to jump in. Otherwise, we can certainly help you troubleshoot this if you send a, a ticket to our uh, support team at uh, support.globus.org. Yeah, I would just, I would go through support on that just to verify. Then you can actually see how the network's set up and what you're trying to transfer and just kind of step through the whole thing. Um, I, I have probably have more questions than we have time for to be us to, to start with, really. So, um, yeah. Other questions? I see Brent has. A, you have a question? I don't actually. Uh, oh, okay. I, asked if I wanted to unmute, but. Uh, oh, okay. Sorry. Uh, yeah, Jacob, you can go ahead and and ask uh, and 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 elaborate. Yeah, so this is one case where you deal with, you, you're working with people who are used to enterprise network. And when you tell them that uh, you don't really have to have uh, firewalls, uh, they're having a hard time comprehending that. <laughs> so, yeah, so um, the firewall on the host uh, server is turned on and only the parts that you, we usually will open for global setup are open. So on the router, on the, the, the wide network, there are no firewalls. Okay. Um, are you looking to use ACLs on the science DMZ 
um, to limit more ports on that, and you're trying to lock those outgoing ports as well? Uh, yes, I think that's what okay. a technician yeah. is actually using. He's using ACL and he's having, he wants, I mean, at first everything was working fine and then he blocked everything and then I had had time, I, I contacted him. He said, well, I'm just gonna allow this port above this range and still, well, so I can get some sort of some connection, but I still have a few issues. Yeah. So I just want to make sure that I understand because when I'm trying to convince them, it's really hard to sell. <laughs> Understood. Um, yeah, I would either open up a ticket with uh, Globus directly or even Epic, uh, the email I shared. I'd, I'd probably start with Globus first and then go through Epic and we can step through that and we can have direct science DMZ discussions with you um, on that and security. And then we can also step through anything related to Globus. Um, but like I said, I'm going to step through those two pieces first. And I mean, I don't know. Yeah, and, and Jacob, to your first comment about, you know, the enterprises networking folks getting nervous. Um, certainly ESnet, I know, has a lot of great material mm -hmm. that talks about how having a science DMZ doesn't mean having an insecure network setup, right? And so, and how it actually is just as secure uh, and locked down as, as sitting behind a firewall if you do it right. So uh, I'm sure Ken can point you to some of those write-ups. I know we've used them a lot of times when talking to uh, security folks and networking folks just to get them more comfortable with this idea of putting something outside the firewall. Yeah, so I've actually gone through the material and I've given presentation on that uh, but I guess it's just a mindset. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You. Uh, Mike, go ahead. Yeah. Um, so just for background, I'm over at the American Museum of Natural History, and uh, we've been using a science DMZ for a couple of years from now. So uh, first of all, for anybody embarking down this, uh, we've been Globus users for a long time. So first of all, if you have a problem with Globus, call Globus. They're really great at helping. If you have a problem with your networking, call ESnet. They're really great about helping. I've used them both, so thank you. The one thing is, is that I just wanted to kind of add on to what Jacob was asking about. Um, I have the unenviable position of both being in charge of the network and just because of the size of our organization also being our CISO. So I have been fighting with myself for years about do I let this open, do I let this not, because the two sides of my brain um, <laughs> are constantly in battle. Um, and those of you that might know me, it explains a lot about me. But what I would say is, is that when we really focused in on securing the DTN at a host level and using things like Wazoo and, and stuff to see when we were as kind of like a little onboard host-based IPS, um, really locking down that that port and, and stuff. We And because it's outside of the rest of our enterprise network and only used for these specialized things, I, I think if you really step your security guys through that and they see how, how you know, it can very well be locked down, they will get over the idea, I actually had to run my security engineers and my networking engineers together on this and show how it was done. So I think the other thing that helps is, uh, and this is just a advice thing, is, is that if you have the right policies, procedures, and things, like as soon as we spot any vulnerability that might be on our DTNs, those get priority because they are maybe a bit more open and don't have the firewall on them. So there is a, you know, a lot of, of things that can be doing. Believe me, um, I had to be very much convinced that this would be secure um, from the outset. So it is uh, possible. So it may also just be in, in general within the community, which I also found to be exceptionally helpful, is get your security and your engineering guys together with others in the community that have done this because they may feel better when they realize that, that this is a problem that we've solved, that people have solved a hundred times over already. Um, on the flip side, the benefit to our researchers has been tremendous. So, you know, Little give got a lot out of it. So that was just a comment I wanted to make because I had already had this fight with myself two years ago. Uh, so I just wanted to let you, you know, realize that there are CISOs out there that can be convinced, including myself. Yeah, thanks. Thanks very much for that, Mike. Um, Jacob actually has a follow-on question. He's asking, so do you have the host firewall turned off? No, we do not have the host firewall turned off. 
we have a host firewall on. We're only allowing the ports into it that we need, and we are doing some limited um, router ACLs, but we're relying on the host security more. And then they're very, very heavily monitored in terms of, you know, anything that's hitting them, they're going into our central log uh, system, series of alerts come off of that when we see things that are out there. So we don't turn off the host firewall, but we're only opening it up for the ports that we need. Great, thank you. In fact, if the host firewall goes off, I, I drop the box off the network until I can figure out what's going on because I want to make sure that that's part of the security. Again, we're only running the minimum number of services that need to be on those DTNs anyway. Um, so the 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 uh, risk profile, the you know the risk surface, attack surface is already very low because virtually nothing is running on these except what is absolutely needed for its one. Uh, resource and in the places where we've done web servers so far, we've had separate web servers that are mounting it so that the web server is the web server in the DTN and running Globus is what it's doing. So we try to keep that very separate. Yeah, that's great. That's that's great advice. And actually, thanks for making that comment about keeping the the amount of stuff on the DTN to to the absolute minimum. I think that's Ken didn't dive into that too much, but I know ESNet recommends that basically the only things you put on there are sonar and Globus, um, pretty much that's it. Uh, some people try and sort of overload that because they say, well, it's not being used all the time, but that sort of starts defeating the purpose and, and creating, as Mike said, a potentially larger attack surface. So yeah, that's great advice. Thank you. Any other uh, questions? I would also say anyone out there thinking that they need to match their um, a 100 gig DTN compared to their 100 gig network. Um, try to get a 10 gig DTN working well first. Uh, you're going to save a lot of time and money trying to get that <laughs> uh, spun up and operating appropriately and uh, try to get that to full like, you know, three terabytes per hour range. Um, and then scaling the, the 10 gig systems out, you know, adding a big 100 gig in there is um, a lot. Of, you're probably not going to get it anyway. So it's um, we, we actually, uh, there's a paper at Epic about that um, setup. Uh, it's just better to try to get a 10 gig system working first. And then you can also segment those out at different security profiles based on different projects, things like that. But, um, and then getting, you know, Globus on there, um, it'll scale very well and, you know, ramp up. But a lot of times the end to end issues, uh, we're seeing, you know, 10 gig servers performing better than 100 gig servers. Just because the capacity is there doesn't mean your end, your, your end to end path is clean. So, um, just want to put that out there. It's a very common thing we run into. So, yeah, I will. I will also add that, um, as you've heard just from this very brief discussion, there's a lot of different scenarios, um, and uh, we encourage everyone to reach out to to both ESNet and and us at Globus. Uh, you know, ahead of time when you're thinking about how you uh, design and architect uh, these infrastructures. Uh, we've seen we've seen a lot of uh, examples of where this was done well, but also some where it wasn't done as well as it could have been. And we can probably help you avoid um, some some pitfalls. And we're always happy to do that. Uh, there's sort of no cost to you. It's just you know we're happy to take the time to help you get it right. Exactly, and, and another resource is an NSF sponsored program, the EPIC at uh, epoc at iu.edu um, is there to help with end-to-end uh, -end transfer problems and end-to-end -end performance. So. Uh, it's another uh, funded funded resource for you to use. Yeah. Okay, we're a few minutes past time. Um, one last call for questions. Otherwise, um, thank you everybody for uh, for joining us. Any final questions? Great. Thanks very much. Uh, this recording will be made available um, shortly. And uh, for those interested in uh, automating instrument flows, just a, a quick plug for our webinar next week at the same time. Again, it'll be just about 20 minutes of presentation. We'll talk through how you can automate some of these flows at scale when you're working with instruments like uh, cryo EM and next gen sequences and so on. Thanks again.